So tonight we have Dr. Sarah Chan, who's a reader in bioethics from the University of Edinburgh. She's in a Chancellor's Fellow in the Usher Institute, which is part of the medical school. Sarah's got quite a, a wide background, an interesting background. She's not a doctor of medicine, but she has a background in science and law. And she comes to us via Australia, Manchester, USA, Japan. So quite widely travelled and quite a wide range of interest in bioethics. And I'll let her explain more <laughs> than I know as to what that's about. So could you please welcome our speaker, Dr. Sarah Chan. Uh, so Claire's been telling me a little bit about what this series usually comprises and I need to warn you that tonight I'm going to talk about science but I'm not going to talk science. So I am a bioethicist and people always say, oh that's interesting, what's that then? Bioethics is the discipline that looks at, I guess, issues of applied moral philosophy. I always feel a bit odd claiming to be a philosopher but that is actually, I am a doctor of philosophy technically. Um, and it is the branch of applied moral philosophy, i.e. the discipline that asks ourselves about what we should do, what is right and wrong, how should we live. Um, it, it's the branch of applied moral philosophy that asks those questions in the context of particularly biomedicine and emerging health technologies. So what I'm going to talk about tonight, as I said, I'm going to talk about science, even if I'm not talking the science. Specifically, I'm going to talk about our role in connection with science and how we understand ourselves <coughs> as, as research participants. So when I say research participation in biomedical research, I mean biomedical research that is on, on me, on you, medical research on human beings. And how do we understand that ethically? What are some of the challenges that we face? What are some of the concerns we may have? What are some of the moral obligations or the ethical imperatives that we might see with respect to biomedical research and how it's being conducted today. I want to start off by asking you uh, three questions. The first one, hopefully most people will find fairly straightforward. Do you think that we should have the right to refuse to participate in biomedical research? So when you turn up and someone says, we're going to do an experiment, should you have the right to say, I don't, I don't want you to do that experiment on me? In fact, for this one, let's have a show of hands. How many people think we should have the right to refuse to participate? Yeah, pretty, pretty much everyone. Okay, and we're going to look at what, what that means. Second question, um, and instead of asking for a show of hands on this, I'm going to get you just to think about it yourselves for a little bit, and then maybe just you know, exchange a couple of thoughts with, the, with someone next to you. So we've said we should have the right to refuse to take part, but is there at the same time a moral obligation when a doctor comes to you and says we're doing some really important research on your condition would you like to be included in the study are there moral reasons that you should say actually yes i will volunteer for that is there a moral obligation to, to take part in biomedical research yeah just have a think about that for a couple of seconds <laughs> So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear this is provoking some, some discussion. We haven't got everybody saying, well, of course not, or of course yes. And I think many of you are, are thinking, well, is the, you know, what does it mean to have an obligation? Would it be enforceable? Is it conditional? What kind of research are we talking about here? And all of those things do make a difference. The last question that I'm going to ask is, do you think we have a right to participate in biomedical research? And just again, have a, have a think about this one. Um, I, I can see brains are already jumping ahead to, well, what does that mean? If I have a right to participate, 
Does that just mean that I can say, hey, I've heard there's a study, I want to be in it? Does it mean I can turn up and knock on the lab doors and say, hey, I demand that you do this research so I can be a part of it? What, what, what does it mean? It's funny to say that they have a right. Right. some things you can do. Yeah. 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 Okay, so with those three questions in mind, let's look at where, where I want to go with this. The, the overall sort of message is to give you a bit of a picture of how we as bioethicists have thought about human participant research. It used to be called human subjects research. We've now moved to saying participants, and I think there's a, there's a reason behind that. Uh, to, to show how human research ethics has been thought about and to suggest that in view of a number of elements, um, the changing landscape of science and biomedicine, um, the, our changing understanding of where people fit in, different forms of research that are coming up, our understanding of, of science and what it does for society, that actually the, the ethical approach, the framework that we use to think about how we as citizens, we as individual people, we as a population, as society, how we regard our participation in science. I think there are reasons that we need new ways to think about this. <coughs> but let's go back to that first question, the right to refuse. We can just say no. And I think we were pretty unanimous about, yeah, we should have the right to say, you know what, I don't want to be part of that. Now, human subjects research has, as I'm sure you're all very aware, a checkered history. The early days of human experimentation were characterised, unfortunately, by numerous abuses of subjects and unethical practices. Some of the most well-known examples of these, of course, uh, so at the top there you have the Nuremberg trials, the World War II medical experiments that subjected unwilling, unconsenting subjects, and they were subjects, they were not participants, it was inflicted on them, they had no choice in the matter, um, exposed the subjects to pain, suffering, harm, death, at the same time, useful medical information, useful data gained, and that problem of what do we then do with that information is, is another ethical dilemma that we won't talk about at the moment. Um, but obviously very, very unethical subjects given no choice and exposed to horrendous harms in the course of research. Uh, the Tuskegee syphilis study, another example often brought up. Uh, so in the mid-20th century, um, a large number of African-American men were involved without their knowledge in a study which, and now interestingly, this study didn't involve conducting experimental procedures on them as such. It was more a monitoring study. So the doctors wanted to know what was the progression of the, the sort of pathological and the organic progression of the disease syphilis. So they took this population of men infected with syphilis and they, they observed them. They just looked at what was happening, they took blood, they did various sort of um, biological examinations in order to build up a picture of what's the progression of the disease. Now, the men didn't know they were being studied, and I think there might be some problems with that. Even more problematically, once a treatment, once an effective treatment became available, the treatment was not offered to the men so that the researchers could continue to study the progression of the disease untreated. Again, the, the, we often think about medical experimentation as doing things to people, but this is a case where failing to do things had just as, just as corrosive an effect. Um, and then also in, in the US there has been a long history, well in the US and some other places, there has been a long history of conducting experiments on prisoners. Uh, experiments such as um, in, in Guatemala studying the um, studying sexually transmitted infections by sending prostitutes, by sending sex workers in, into prisons and allowing prisoners to become infected and studying them. The US um, President's Commission on Bioethics, as it then was in the early 2000s, um, had an inquiry into this and to, to look at and really expose and scrutinise all of the practices that were, um, that were undertaken as a part of this research. So, as I say, an extremely checkered history. The key sorts of features of these abuses is that they often involved marginalised or otherwise disadvantaged groups. The research was conducted without their knowledge or without their consent, and often in directly or indirectly harmful ways. So, when we have the very strong feeling that, of course, you should have the right to say no, that's based both in our sort of thinking about, well, we, we should all 
as autonomous human beings have the right to decide what happens to us. But it's also against that background of knowing that in, in the early and mid 20th century particularly, there were many experiments that were carried out on humans who did not get the chance to say no, even though they would and should have wanted to. The, the experiments that were carried out had a knock-on impact on how we think about ethics, even to this day. So the Nuremberg Code, the, really the first written code of how to conduct medical research on, on humans, the first written ethical code, the very first article of the Nuremberg Code begins by saying the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. The Declaration of Helsinki, produced by the World Medical Association for the first time in 1964 and updated every, um, every sort of few years since then, I think the most recent revision being a few years ago, uh, but the, the original version um, fairly early on says clinical research on a human being cannot be undertaken without his free consent after he has been informed, so informed consent. It also emphasises at any time during the course of the research, the subject should be free to withdraw permission. So the, the focus here is really on the protection of the research subject. The emphasis is on informed consent and the right to refuse, the right to say no, or the right to withdraw. So even after you've said yes, the right to say, actually, I, 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 now, I now exercise my option to refuse. The underlying presumptions here, again, you can understand, given the historical context, how these have come about. The presumption is that participation in research is something that's either likely to be harmful or perhaps something that's inherently harmful, whether or not it inflicts physical harm, that somehow being included in research is something that's dangerous to people. And again, looking at the nature of the experiments that were done, they were very much harmful. The default position in, in this approach where consent is the, the sort of keystone, the default position is non-participation unless consent. So you can't say, well, they're not objecting, that constitutes consent. There has to be explicit consent or, or you don't participate. And if you look at it, and again, for these understandable reasons, it's somewhat adversarial. It casts the interests of, particip of the participants on the one hand and of science and scientists on the other into a sort of opposition because it assumes that scientists want science to go ahead but participants don't want to be part of science or they, it's going to be bad for them to be part of science. Now, that feels caricatured in a way because, of course, we have a much more nuanced understanding of the different motivations and the forces that can shape science and the reasons that we may have as participants or as people who choose not to participate for our position towards science. But nevertheless, the ethical position really, I think, up till the end, at least the end of the 20th century, and even now the dominant position in, um, in many ethics committees is this idea that we have to protect people from participating in research, unless they're really, really sure that they want to do it, and then if they've given consent and it's been signed three times over, all right, you can do it. Okay, <clears throat> the ethical basis of consent is often said to be um, respect for persons. So the Belmont Report, published in the 1970s um, by, uh, by, the, uh, by the US, had three principles, and the first of these was respect for persons, respect for autonomy. The idea that we should have the right to decide what happens to us, and that extends, of course, to bodily integrity, that we shouldn't have interventions performed on our, on our bodies without, without consent. The requirements for, for consent include that it be informed, so the participant must have been told about the purpose of the study, what's going to happen to them um, as a result, what the possible risks are, what the likely outcomes are, all of those sorts of things. Consent has to be voluntary, so it has to be not coerced. Uh, and I just invite you to reflect upon that a little bit. Obviously, if somebody is sitting there with a the hammer saying, sign the form or I will break your arm, that's obvious coercion. I think if you're in a situation where it's your family physician who's also saying, by the way, we're running this study, no pressure, but would you like to participate? Um, it's, not, it's not deliberate coercion, but that relationship of power is something that I think we still need to be aware of. Similarly with information, uh, participants, one of the concerns is that participants are disempowered with respect to how much they know about the research versus how much the researchers know about the research. But that's, in a way, always going to be the case, unless you're doing research on yourself. 
the people running the study are always going to be more in the know. So <laughs> I think it's going to be very difficult to ever say we're completely, you are as informed um, as someone who has years of scientific training and has designed the study and written and, and read all the papers. How informed can the participants genuinely be? How voluntary can it be if there's any kind of relationship <coughs> Of, um, of power between the parties. And finally, they, um, the participant has to have the capacity to consent, so they need to be able to understand what's being asked of them, to weigh it up, to take it on. We sometimes refer to this as, as being competent to consent, so similar to competent to consent to medical treatment. Okay, so problems with consent in research. Bioethicists writing about research ethics have noted that consent has almost become what we might call fetishized, that um, as soon as you say, well, um, you know, what are, is, is this research ethical? It just boils down to, did you get consent? If, if so, great. If no, not ethical. That consent has become not just the, not just the keystone, but the only element of what, is, of, of what is thought about ethically, sometimes to the exclusion of other issues. Um, so that's, that's one problem. Have we become too focused on individual consent as the only thing that, that either makes research ethical or not. But there are other problems. What about when consent is difficult to obtain? So Ben Goldacre in his book Bad Science, uh, which I highly recommend if, if you haven't read it, uh, he talks about an example of emergency room research on treatment for head injury. And what the research group wanted to do, there were there were different treatments um, were sort of state of the art at the time, but actually the evidence base for which one of them was, was better was lacking. So there were completely different treatments in operation, but they didn't know which was better. The research team wanted to do a project to basically to, to test out, um, to a little bit more systematically say, hey, let's randomise and let's evaluate what the results are to see whether treatment A is better or treatment B is better. Now, the problem when somebody comes into emergency with an acute head injury is that usually they are unconscious, they can't give you consent. So the ethics committee said, well, this is a problem, we can't get consent from them, sent the form back, months of delays, um, why don't you get consent from the relatives? So, someone comes into the emergency room, they want to include them in the study, before they can give them any treatment, before they can decide we're going to include you in the study and give you treatment A or treatment B, they've got to phone around trying to get hold of a relative to say, hey, can, you know, can we include this person in the study? Consequently, people delayed in receiving treatment while they're going around trying to obtain consent, which in itself is obviously a bad thing. But then the delay not only to treatment of individual patients, but the delay in eventually what they found, they managed to do the study, all of the ethical hurdles around consent notwithstanding, and what they found is that one treatment was vastly better than the other. In other words, when they've been conducting the two treatments more or less equally, half the patients were getting a really much, much worse option of care. They found this out, they made the, the better option the standard, now all patients receive this, but the time that it took for them to go through hoops and hoops and hoops about informed consent from unconscious patients is months in which they didn't know and which people were receiving the worst treatment. So, you know, months of people worse off, months of lives not saved because of this idea that, well, but we can't get consent because they're unconscious. Okay, so uh, focusing on consent to the exclusion of all else can have an unethical effect in terms of, of compromising patients' treatment and holding up research that leads to life-saving outcomes. But also, think about who might be excluded when research is basically on an opt-in basis. If you can't give consent, you can't be in research. Who's not going to be in it? We've talked about unconscious patients. Patients who lack capacity to give consent, so perhaps patients who have um, brain injury or mental health issues, young children are not going to be able to consent. And that's not to say that research ethics hasn't <coughs> considered this and created pathways to say, oh, okay, we know we need to do research on children, but we're going to have to go through lots more hoops. But there, there is a very real phenomenon of you're just a bit too difficult to do research on. And this is happening... Um, this is happening in, in other areas now. A colleague of mine talks about um, the it's too difficult problem in ethics um, of using certain sorts of data. So in her field, um, photographic data is really important as part of diagnosis and, um, and treatment, and that can be used in research on the condition. But because photographic data is identifiable, it's hard to use it 
you can't anonymize it in the same way. And so rather than go through the extra ethical hoops, it's easier to just say we won't use that, even though the research you could conduct if you did use it could potentially be so much more powerful. So there's a kind of um, root path of least resistance problem that if you make some paths more difficult, if you say it's going to be harder to do this research on people who don't speak English well, people whose ment mental uh, faculties are more limited, children, the path of least resistance might be, let's just not do those experiments. Um, and actually we know from looking at the history of clinical trials that we have a lot less data on things like pediatric, pediatric drug effects because children are ethically difficult to research on. The consequence? Harmful. Lack of benefits, lack of knowledge about how these drugs work in certain populations. Okay, so focusing on consent, problematic in that sense. But also, new forms of research that are coming online, particularly in the last couple of decades, using things like bioresources. So when I say bioresources, I mean tissue samples, health data, genetic information. It becomes hard to see exactly how consent's going to work. Where does consent come in, in those cases? Or right at the point at which the doctor's sticking the needle in my arm, saying I'm going to take some of your blood and we're going to extract DNA and, and process your genetic information. I can clearly at that point say yes, I consent, or no, I don't consent. But when my DNA has been in a national database for 10 years, and someone comes along and says, I want to do a research project on this, can I include your information? Do they come back to me for consent? Do they not? If they do, am I still living where I was? What do they do if they can't get hold of me? Do they assume that I don't want to be in it? Do we go with the presumption of no consent is no research? What's that going to do to the value of a, of a biobank, of a database? something like UK Biobank that started with half a million individuals. If you went back to them for specific consent for everything that was going to be done research-wise in the Biobank and you assumed that when they didn't reply, they no longer consented, would no longer have half a million participants in it. Okay, so consent is problematic in terms of the new forms of research that are becoming more, more and more common. Okay, so much for a uh, right to refuse and the focus on consent. Let's think about the second question I pose, about the duty to volunteer. This idea that we have perhaps a moral obligation to support research has a number of philosophical <laughs> foundations. And they go something like this. First of all, we have a duty of beneficence. If we can do good for others, if we can do good to others, then we should do that. The rule of rescue is a particular form of the duty of beneficence that specifically says, if you can save a life, then, then you should. So the, the classic uh, moral philosophy rule of rescue is, you see a child drowning in, in a pond, you could throw a life ring or hold them a branch and you could fish them out, or you could continue on your merry way and leave them to drown. What should you do? Most of us would say, you should probably stop and rescue the child. So rule of rescue, it's a specific example of a very particular sort of life-saving beneficence. There's also an argument from fairness, and that, that goes uh, something like, we are pro probably, there are very few of us today who, who would still be here were it not for the benefits of modern biomedicine. So whether you've had your appendix out, whether you've had, had antibiotics, uh, whether you have asthma and allergies, we have all benefited um, from medical research, and if you're, if you're one of the people who happens to be preternaturally healthy and you've never needed recourse to modern medicine, probably still most of your family wouldn't be here, so you can still say you've, you've benefited in that way. So we've benefited from past research. In fairness, we should support research to continue so that other people can go on benefiting in the future. And related to that, um, there's the idea that perhaps science is a valuable social institution that we should support in the same way that uh, having education, clean water, good roads, um, a protected environment, science is something else that a, a well-functioning society has research going on that produces social benefits. So if we accept the, the application of those, uh, those ethical principles, and if we accept that biomedical research requires human participation, we might ask ourselves whether we have an obligation to participate in it in order to support science, for all of the reasons on, on the left. This argument that we have a moral obligation to support research because of this rests on a number of assumptions, notably the, the assumption that science or that research as a whole will actually produce health benefits. 
so all of these arguments about beneficence and rescue and, and so forth fall down if we don't think science is going to do anything good. Uh, note that it doesn't assume that every single piece of science individually is going to have benefits. So some research doesn't, you know, some experiments fail, some research doesn't have useful results, but we can't predict in advance which of those so, uh, it, it will be. So by supporting science in general, we're going to help bring those benefits about. Um, the other assumption is that these benefits will actually be available to publics and I guess that they'll be fairly distributed. Because again, if we volunteer for the research, we produce the knowledge, but then that knowledge doesn't save the lives it could have saved for whatever reason, perhaps because of, um, of intellectual property requirements that hamper how it can be used, perhaps because the actual cost of the science is too expensive and we don't have the healthcare budget to afford it. If the benefits don't become available, then our moral justification has a hole in it somewhere. Um, okay, well, I think the discussion might be a good place to draw out some of these concerns that we might have about whether science is actually good. Is it doing the good that it can, and what do we need to do to make sure that it does? Um, but let's let's go on and think about some of the some of the consequences. If, in fact, at this stage, um, it might be a, a good point to have a show of hands. Uh, when when I asked you to think about it and, and talk amongst yourselves, I know it's it's going to depend on and depend on and depend on and be conditional. But just as a gut, gut feeling. Raise your hand if you thought maybe we do have an obligation of some sort, even if it's not enforceable. Um, but do, raise your hand if you thought maybe there are good moral reasons to volunteer to be part of. Yeah? Okay, and I, I can see that some people are skeptical about this, and I think there are, especially if you think about the history that I've just gone through. To go from a, a very recent, within the last hundred years, people were coerced and conscripted into research against their will and directly harmed as a result. It, it can feel quite comfortable to move from that to saying, ah, but it was your duty, which of course we're not saying in, in that case. Um, okay, so the significance of asserting that perhaps there is an obligation to participate certainly isn't to conscript everyone in, into research. And for those who have hesitations, you, you know, I think those, those should be respected. The idea that we have good moral reasons to do something isn't necessarily the same as saying everyone must do it. So I will make that clear. Um, but I think it does a number of things for us. To, to just reframe the question from should we have the right to say no to maybe we have some kind of reason or obligation or duty to say yes and say let's actually do this. Um, I think it prompts us to question the presumption that research is necessarily going to be harmful. We don't want to say you have an obligation to bring harm to yourself, uh, but is research always going to be harmful? And I hope it also encourages us to think about how we perceive the researcher-participant relationship, how we look upon science and scientists. I know many of you out there will be scientists, and we say, of course, we, you know, we're not the bad guys here. Um, but that adversarial relationship that I talked about, where if what an ethics committee sees itself as doing is protecting the vulnerable participants from the scientists who want to do bad things to them, um, if we can get away from that and say, well, actually, uh, scientists, by and large, yes, there are some bad eggs and um, that has very unfortunate consequences. But scientists, by and large, do science because they want to help people. They want to develop new treatments. They want to make a better society. Um, so if we can start to think about a relationship of hope and trust more than one of mutual suspicion, then maybe that's going to have implications for how we understand science and our position in relationship to it. So, I imagine the reason that some people were hesitant about saying, well, we should have an obligation to participate in research is it's not clear what we might be required to do. If Once we admit, okay, I have a moral obligation to participate in research, are we all then required to sign up for flu camp or admit that we are just inherently bad people? I don't think so. I, I, I don't think that that's what's required. Are we actually obliged to risk danger to ourselves in pursuit of beneficence and the rule of rescue. Uh, I will say as well, um, some philosophers have devoted a lot of uh, journal pages to arguing about whether it is a duty or an obligation or whether we just have moral reasons to do it. I'm going to be loose in my language here and say it's not, it's not a perfect duty, obviously, 
Um, I, I think I think that when you have moral reasons to do something, you can loosely say there's a moral obligation, but you might not fulfil it. The existence of there being good reasons to participate doesn't negate your right to refuse. So you might say, well, it would be very good of me to volunteer for flu camp. It might be what we call supererogatory, um, me meaning it's, it's good of me to do it, but I can't be blamed for not doing it. Classic example of supererogation is giving a live, a live kidney donation to someone you don't know. Morally, incredibly praiseworthy, but I don't go around in the street and say, have you given a kidney today? If not, why not? So it's not blameworthy, right? Um, but we have to remember as well that the rule of rescue doesn't, there's no duty to risk your own life. It's a rule of easy rescue. So the child drowning in the pond, if there's no life-saving saving apparatus nearby and you can't swim, you're not really obliged to go into the pond and risk drowning yourself if, if that's what it takes. It's a rule of easy rescue, if you can rescue it at low or minimal cost to, to yourself. So what does that mean for participation in research? I think there are a number of easy rescues. We don't all have to go to flu camp, uh, but there are some things that we can do that are low or minimal risk, low or minimal cost to ourselves that would help to support science. Uh, one of these is data research. Uh, so you may have heard the you may have heard data saves lives, rights require responsibilities. There's very much a move towards trying to use the vast amounts of patient routine health data that exist out there in our NHS uh, to try and understand on a population scale. You know, you put millions of data points together and you start to see connections that you didn't see before. You start to see things that might be environmentally related. Hey, why is everyone in this area developing a particular form of cancer? You start to see interactions between genetics and, and environment. You start to see things um, that can lead us to both understanding this prevention, so say lifestyle factors that, that say if you have this particular combination of say genetics and environmental factors, then definitely don't do this or it's going to vastly increase your risk of disease. You find out things about treatments. The classic example here is what used to be called pharmacogenetics, uh, where we know that some form, some sorts of cancer are susceptible to, to certain sorts of treatments and others completely not. And you can do a genetic test and say, have this treatment because it's got a really good chance of working or don't have this treatment because it's not effective on that kind. So we can have, it's what's uh, becoming called precision medicine as well, so targeted targeted treatments that use health in, and biological information in order to have a more precise effect. Um, all that data is out there. And if all we need to do to participate, to fulfill our obligation, is allow our data to be included, I would say that's a fairly easy rescue. Now, it's not risk-free because, of course, we're very concerned about our health data. We're concerned about our next-door neighbour finding out that we um, have some nasty disease, we're concerned maybe about our workplace finding out that we have mental health issues. There's a lot of harm just because it's not somebody coming up and jabbing a needle in your arm um, or give, forcing a drug down your throat. The fact that it's data doesn't mean that there aren't potential harms, but as long as the mechanisms are in place to try and safeguard against those, simply saying, yes, you can use my data is a pretty easy rescue. Now, what about, in the same vein of easy rescue, what about the use of cells and tissue samples that are taken as part of treatment? So you go to the hospital, you have a biopsy of your tumour, Those the doctor looks at the cells, does the diagnostic test they need to do, and then says, shall I put the sample in the bin, or can we do research with it? It sounds, again, like an easy rescue to say yes, but again, not without its, not without its ethical, without its ethical, issues. Um, have people heard of Henrietta Lacks? And most, yeah, a few of you, yeah. So Henrietta Lacks was a patient um, in the early part of the uh, early part of the 20th century. She presented to a, she was a poor black woman, presented to a hospital with a very particular aggressive form of cancer. Biopsies were taken, the doctors were unable to treat her cancer, so she died within a year of turning up for treatment but they were also able to use the cells they'd taken from her to create the very first immortal human cell line, the HeLa cell line. And that cell line, uh, the, the cell line by, by itself, by the way, wasn't actually directly patented. 
uh, but it has been used in the development of numerous treatments, numerous beneficial treatments, and numerous commercially valuable products as well. Um, again, maybe this is something to say for the discussion to get into the, some of the ethical in, ins and outs of, of this case. Part of the problem, she, she was never asked for consent, but at that time it was less common for it was less common for consent directly to be asked and more common for patients to assume that doctors will just do things with, with my cells because that's what doctors do. Um, we'll maybe get into that in, in the discussion. But uh, this is not Henrietta Lacks. This is a guy called John Moore. John Moore has in some ways a similar story. He had, another, he had a, for a rare form of hairy cell leukemia, so he had a blood cancer, went to the doctors, they took samples, uh, in this case, I think they were actually able to, to treat his cancer effectively. The doctors kept on taking samples from him because they thought these cells look very useful. Um, and they made a cell line from his cells without his knowledge. They patented the cell line and started selling it to other researchers all over. John Moore found out, and he was not very pleased. Um, he hadn't been consulted. He'd in fact been told that he was going back to receive further treatment when what they needed was more of his cells to do their research. He said, they are making money from my genetic essence and I should have a share of that. The court said, no, actually, you don't own your cells. Now that they've been turned into a cell line, the researchers own the cells. They're entitled to make money. You don't get a, sh a share of the profits from the patent. They did, however, say that the researchers had breached the duty of care they owed John Moore as their patient by essentially deceiving him about what, about what they were doing. So he did get a bit of a payout, but what he did not get was any rights over the patent that enabled him to, to make money from his cells directly. Okay, so th these are both problematic cases in different ways. Um, but if you were to go into the hospital and have a biopsy taken, and actually a doctor were to say, we'd like to do some research with your cells, we think these cells could save lives, um, would it, in a sense, be wrong to say no? Would it be wrong to say, you know what, I don't care if my cells could save a thousand people, I just want you to put them in the bin and destroy them. Now, bearing in mind that the fact that there are moral reasons to do something doesn't mean you don't have the right to not do it. I think people have the right to say it's my stuff, don't use it. I think they might not be in the right to do so. So I think the morally right course of action would be to say, yeah, go ahead and use them, save those lives, easy rescue. Okay. I'm just going to, before we move on to the next section, just leave you with the extension of this problem, which is if you think, um, you know, maybe at the point when, when you're giving the cells, you retain the right to say no, even if it would be, it would be very nice of you, it would, be, it would be good of you, it would be morally good of you to say, save the lives of my cells, but you don't say, they retain the right to actually say, I just don't feel like saving lives today. Um, how far down the line, when those, let's say on that day you say, sure, go ahead, two years later, they're almost at the point of, now we've developed your cells into this great therapeutic product, we're going to start rolling them out, can you, at that point, come in and say, no, nope, they're still my cells, you're not having them. I don't care that you invested two years and however many million dollars. I don't care that now you're on the brink of saving 10,000 lives, but they are still my cells. I want them back. I'll leave you with that. Um, okay. Let's move on to the third question. Is there a right to participate in research? Now, as recently as about 10 or so years ago, when I first started thinking and talking about this, um, and again, casting your minds back to the beginning of the talk and all of the terrible things that have been done to human beings in the name of biomedical research. I raised this idea at a workshop with colleagues and someone was genuinely horrified. They were like, why would you even ask such a question? You know, think about Tuskegee, think about Nuremberg. What do you mean a right to participate? The right is the right to refuse. That's the, the golden right in research. I think is the right to refuse. They were genuinely horrified that I could even think of saying, let's turn that around and say there's not just a right to say no, but there should be a right to be included. But, you know, I think times, as I say, are, are changing. We, as patients, bear a different relationship to our doctors and our healthcare system and our biomedical research ecosystem than, than we have in the past. Uh, it isn't the case any longer, as it was in Henrietta Lacks's day, that people wouldn't really be asked or told about what was going to happen to their samples. These days we expect to have a say, we expect to know what's going on. 
we are more active not only in, in terms of research but our treatment choices. We want to understand why we prescribed this, what's the latest science. There's been a real shift in the medical profession from paternalism, the doctor knows best, to a patient autonomy, it's my body, I want to understand, I want to make the choice, and that's been reflected in medical law as well. Uh, patients have a far greater role now in driving science through creating demand, and that can be political demand, so patient advocacy groups that mobilise and say, hey, we are a group of patients, we have this condition, we want you to investigate cures, um, groups such as Parkinson's Advocacy, MS, all of these types of groups are out there saying, look, we need cures, what can we do to propel the science? So political demand, but also consumer demand, um, because if there's enough demand for treatments that people will pay for, it will pull the science in that way. All of this is being facilitated, not least by the internet, so increased connectivity, access to information, the good old Dr. Google, but also <coughs> the ability of people to connect with others. Sites like Patients Like Me, where people with health conditions actively go on and share information about Here's, here's me, here's my medical condition, let's try and understand this because the doctors aren't seeing the picture that we're seeing from the inside. Um, increased access of publics to scientific information, so online publishing. People are much more willing, and we, we saw this to a huge extent during COVID. Um, people going online, reading peer-reviewed research, or going on um, pre-peer pre review publication sites such as Archive, MedArchive, BioArchive, and looking at the pre-publication research on there and trying to interact with it and evaluate it. Publics assuming the epistemic mindset and, and critical eye of scientists, even if they don't necessarily have the formal training. Um, okay, and uh, finally there's this blurring of boundaries between what's healthcare and what's, what's research. Um, we're seeing this particularly with respect to experimental treatments. You know, something is rolled out, it's a new treatment, it's experimental, so we're still doing research on it, but um, we're also hoping it's going to, it's going to treat things. Um, why would you think about a right to participate? Let me, uh, <coughs> let me tell you a story. Patient with advanced ovarian cancer in a cancer ward, um, medical professional herself knows that a clinical trial is being conducted of a new drug um, asks to be included in the study, they say no. Her treating oncologist who's running the study and also a, a colleague of hers knows that there are vials of the drug sitting in the fridge um, as part of the trial that are surplus, they're not going to be used, they're going to be thrown out and sent back to the supplier. She's saying, can I try this drug? What would you do? What could you do? She didn't get to go in the trial. She didn't get access to the drug. She died from her cancer. But here is a very poignant example of where people might want to say, there's a trial going on and it could help me. I want to be in it. Why can't I be in it? So uh, not just cancer drugs, although those are, a, those are a big example, but a lot of the new molecular technologies, so things like experimental cell and gene therapies that are coming out, there's a huge demand for access to these, even at the experimental stage. The way that people tend to access them, it often involves crowdfunding a lot of money, taking, it's usually someone's sick child, taking the sick child to America or to some place where they can provide the treatment. It might work, it might not. Uh, but these therapies, there's no doubt, are in demand. Um, and then the other situation where I think we really need to think about a right to participate is this research use of routine health data that I was just talking about. Because again, who is included and who is excluded is going to have huge effects in terms of who that data is relevant to. Recall what I was saying about lack of information about paediatric drug effects. If your population health data collects only the information of a certain section of the population, uh, let's say those who have better access to care, those who have lower levels of mistrust in science. Um, we know, again, this came out during COVID, we know that black and minority ethnic populations have higher levels of, oh, I don't trust what doctors are going to do. And again, think historically, there's, there's good reason behind that. But if there are people who, who say, actually, I don't want to be in this because I don't trust you, and if that happens systemically for a certain group of people, all the research that we do with our health data is going to exclude that group, and that means we won't know about things that will be relevant to them. So this is a compounding problem of justice in healthcare and medicine. Okay, I don't have very long left, so I'm just going to run you through a, the skeleton of 
a philosophical argument supporting there being a right to participate. Um, I'm going to talk about three aspects. I'm not going to talk about rights because that gets more legalistic, but I'm going to talk about autonomy, which you'll recall was the sort of main justification for requiring informed consent. And I'm going to talk about how actually it should ground not just the right to refuse, but also the right to participate, the right to say yes. I'm going to talk about patient interest in participation. And finally, this idea of science as a valuable social institution. OK, so informed consent, what does it do? I said towards the start of the talk that it was based on the ethical principle of respect for persons, respect for autonomy, our right to make decisions for ourselves. But the right to refuse is asymmetrical. The right to, to say, no, I don't want to be in it, is kind of only half the story. What about the things you don't get asked? It's all very well for your doctor to come and say, do you want to be in it, yes or no? But what about the study that you don't get asked to be in? You don't have autonomy in that sense. So if your only option is to, to say no when offered to you, that's not really complete autonomy. That's quite limited. Now, compare this with the other sorts of decisions that we let people make about their lives. On the grounds of autonomy, we allow people to refuse medical treatment, even where this would lead to harm or death. We allow people to pursue mountain climbing and other extreme sports because we say it's your choice your autonomy means we should let you live your life as you want to live it. We allow personal risk-taking in lots of other areas. Why not in research? Why do we say, well, that's too risky, you're not going to be given a choice about whether you're not going to be given a right or a chance to participate. It's too dangerous. Um, go up Mount Everest and refuse treatment all you want, but there's no access to demand it and say, I want to have a go of this, even if it looks improbable, even if it looks dangerous. Why aren't we giving people autonomy to that extent? People, as I say, may have genuine interests. There, there may be good reasons for them to want to take part. Uh, the cancer drugs and clinical trials is one really good example. Taking part in research may actually be in a patient's best interest if the treatment has a chance of working for them, or at least it might not be against them. People also have interests in feeling they have autonomy in a situation of severe, perhaps terminal illness where so many factors are out of control. The ability to say, I want to know if there's a study and I want to be part of it can be a really important, some, something that they can do at a time when there's very little else they can do. It might at least give them a hope. It might be a last chance or it might be seen as a last chance that makes their last days a bit better for the feeling of having tried to do something. Or even if they think, look, it's not going to help me, it's too late for me, but at least I can do something today that will help others tomorrow and next year and the year after that. So altruism. Moreover, the reasons that we have for excluding participants from research aren't always to do with what's in their medical best interests or with scientific validity. So the sort of the, the easy answer to, hey, why can't I be in this clinical trial? I think it could help me and I really want to be in it, is either to say, look, you're, you're too sick and it won't be good for you, or something like, you're, you're outside the, the kind of who we want to be in, and if we put your results in, it's going to model the rest of the study and it will be harder to get data. There are ways to, to deal with that. Um, we, we've proposed in some of our work ways of dealing with separate sets of, um, of data such that you can give people access to these treatments. But again, the reasons that people are excluded aren't actually always to do with it's going to be in your best interest not to participate, or it's going to be more scientifically valid to exclude you. Sometimes they're to do with a lot of other forces, commercialization, what's going to be easier for the company. There's that path of least resistance again. Um, so there are a lot of hidden forces that shape research, who gets to be part of research, what drives these, these research priorities, the factors that drive this aren't actually always working to our benefit. And then lastly, the idea that we have a right to participate in research. If you were sympathetic to the argument that science is a valuable social institution that we should support, like education and, and so forth, maybe we don't just have a duty to support it, but we also have a right to participate in it. Kind of like the right to vote. You know, democracy is socially important and we all not only should take part, but we have a right to take part. Do scientists have a right to do science? Do citizens have a right to be part of science? These are the sorts of questions that I think we need to be thinking about. Is the right to participate a good idea or a bad idea? Just to end with, I'm going to give you an example where I think it is a good idea, an example where I think it 
maybe is a bad idea. The good idea example is this precision medicine health data. I've used the graphic from the US Precision Medicine Initiative, but um, you'll probably be aware of other similar initiatives um, that are taking place in the UK at the moment. Um, the bad idea is um, unproven cell treatments. So, a right to participate in something like a population level precision medicine project. These kinds of projects, what, what they ask is where are you in relation to the knowledge that we gain from everyone? If your data is not in, then the results of the research will be less relevant to you. And this is where, as I was saying, inclusion in research, the right to be included is an issue of justice as much as the right to exclude yourself. So. I think the right to participate and recognising that people have this right even where they're not asserting it and paying attention to things like, hey, in our recruitment for this new genomics project, have we got you know, our diverse groups represented? Who's missing? Why are they missing? What can we do? That's really important. A case where I think it's a bad idea, um, in, particularly in the US but also in other countries, there have been in the last, say, 15 or so years, a proliferation of clinics piggybacking on the idea of stem cells as a wonder drug for regenerative medicine and peddling all sorts of treatments, many of which are unproven, many of which have no scientific basis, and at least some of which are unsafe. Um, about five or six years ago, three women were treated with stem cells injected into their eyes in a clinic in Texas, and they all went blind. Um, there are people who are, yeah, all sorts of really quite negative effects. And yet, in the US, this, this movement has arisen called the right to try. You'll see the, the um, scrap line there, how the federal government prevents Americans from getting the life-saving treatments they need. So what the FDA is doing is stepping in saying, stop selling this stuff, you're killing people and making them blind and there's no basis and you're taking their money and you're going to hurt them. Um, so the governments come in as I think they should do and are trying to regulate this and the patients are saying, you are infringing my right to try this experimental treatment, hence the name of the right to try. And there's this really interesting kind of dynamic going on here where both sides think the other side are the bad guys. So the scientists say the clinics that are peddling these unproven treatments are giving a false illusion of hope to patients with terminal illnesses. These patients are desperate, they'll try anything, they're, they're willing to give over all their money for some hope of a treatment. The clinics, um, the, the clinics are saying what we need to do is stop the FDA from denying access to this research, denying access to the experimental drugs. So both sides make out that each other are the bad guys. But where the argument about the right to participate kind of comes in is that this argument's being framed in terms of a right to science. So, you know, it's my right to try, my right to be part of something experimental. They're framing the treatments. Um, some of them are registered as clinical trials, even though they never publish any results. They talk about things like N, N of 1 clinical trials, and normally a clinical trial requires a certain number to, to have adequate power, but they're saying, look, we're just treating you, but we'll, we'll call it an N of 1 trial. So it kind of masquerades as science. And people are saying, I have a right to participate in science, let me have my stem cells. Okay, so that's a case where I don't think the right to participate in science justifies letting people have access. Um, but What's been really interesting, and I had a project a few years ago looking into the dynamics of the, the kind of conversations and the different positions that were being assumed in this discourse over unproven cell treatments. Um, okay, what needs to, to change in the world about science? I hope that I've um, given you a picture of where we've come from in our thinking about taking part in, in biomedical research and said, hey, maybe for the 21st century we need a, a new way to think about this. I do think that there, it's, it's worth talking about and thinking about a right to participate. And by that I don't mean an absolute license to demand that a study be carried out or that you be included in a study even where it's futile or meaningless or going to cost money and not achieve anything good. Um, but we do need to think about who, who's making these decisions about what's futile or meaningless or not good value for money. We're not just talking about scientific value, but social value. And the way in which these decisions are made often excludes people from participation in the wider sense of, of dialogue and having input into what goes on. It's not a license to demand that a certain piece of research be done in a certain way. Uh, but we do need to look at who's deciding, who is making these decisions, who's in control of science. 
what factors are driving science in the different directions and, and how. We need to think about participation not just as the one to take the experimental treatment or the one to donate cells for data. The WHO definition of the right to health includes participation of the population in health-related decision-making. Does a right to science or a right to participate in research include the right to participate in social processes and decisions about science? And particularly with respect to that sort of opposition that's going on where both sides think, it's that, back to that adversarial dynamic, right? Who's the bad guys here? Is that being driven partly by patients feeling that they are excluded from participation in the broad sense, that they don't have a voice, that they don't have input into scientific decisions, that the big apparatus of science and the FDA is rolling on without them and they are voiceless and not getting a say? Is that what's causing that? So I think there's an argument to say science maybe needs to have a look and clean up its own house and work out how each can allow each of us as citizens to participate in research. Okay, that's, that's it. I'm sorry, Claire, I've got a bit over time, but thank you all very much for your attention. Um, and I look forward to some questions and discussion if we have time. A thing that I was wondering about as we were speaking was the question of national cultures in medicine. Mm. What I mean by that is historically it was notorious that American medicine was unusual in being driven by surgery rather than any other specialism. And because that's the most interventionist form of medicine you can have, mm -hmm. and the one way the patient is the most passive. Um, and I wonder if those sort of differences shape not only the way that the science is done, but the way that the population responds to it, and if anybody's looked at that. Uh, so I think they very much do. I can't say, I can't off the top of my head point you to who has looked at it. Uh, but I'll give you an example that I think illustrates that. Um, the, uh, another big difference, so I'm less familiar with the culture of practicing medicine, but more the public's um, expectations of healthcare and approach to what, how a healthcare system works and what it should do. Um, the other major difference, of course, between US and UK is we have the NHS. We have quite a strong belief in publicly funded healthcare free at the point of delivery, um, and the US is you pay. Um, whether you pay through an insurer or you just pay, you, you pay. So medicine is a consumer commodity there, more of a public good or a public service here. Um, speaking of precision medicine, you may or may not remember that about 12 or so years ago, um, 12 or so years ago, the government um, through NHS England announced an initiative called Care.Data, and this was a proposal to use, um, kind of as I described, the routine healthcare information of patients on, on the NHS to form a database that they could then use for research to find out about all of those things that I, that I suggest we could find out about. Um, population health, environmental determinants, genetic, um, all, all of those sorts of things. It was scientifically a proposal that made a lot of sense. Socially, in the way they presented it, it was not very well done, let's say. Um, it got a lot of pushback because the way that it came out was it's going to be an, an opt-out. It wasn't easy to opt-out. People weren't, didn't feel they'd been well informed. And then somewhere in there came out the, um, the information that they were going to allow access to the database by commercial organisations for their research. Now, it wasn't just going to be NHS sells your private data um, to private corporations for profit. It wasn't that simple, but there was going to be some degree of, of corporate access. And so England collectively stamped its foot, said, no way, uh, we're not having that. Um, the project went away, and the idea to use health data has positively, I think, come back in other forms since. So I think it is, the research itself is really valuable, but how you do it and how you go about it and the social license is the way it's being talked about. Um, make, making sure that you have that is, is very important. Um, around the same time in the US, uh, a project, uh, not a project even really, a company called Aravale Personalised Wellness was taking off. And what they were proposing to do was collect up all of your health data and do a whole bunch more tests on you um, and collect your data and the data of everybody else uh, who was wealthy enough to pay, I think, a subscription fee of $4,000. Uh, collect all of that data and then 
turn that into a research resource to be sold to private companies. You would then, uh, if you, as long as you continue to pay three or four thousand dollars a year, get access to some of that information for prediction for your personalised wellness. But the fact remains, it was still a let's collect everyone's data if they're rich enough to pay to have it collected, as opposed to the NHS, which collects our data at no cost to us. Pay to have your data collected. Pay again to have it analysed. Pay to allow companies to make their own profits off it, and then you get a bit of benefit back. And I was there scratching my head, going, how how can, on the one hand, something that is public data with public money for primarily public good. People have turned around and gone, we're not having that. And on the other side of the pond, Americans are all like, yeah, let's buy the right to have companies use our Do <laughs> you, you know what I mean? I thought that's, but I think it is because of the difference in the breach of social license with care.data was at least partly around that rupture of we expect it as a public institution, publicly funded, public benefit, and that mm, we're letting private corporations buy into this, that disrupted things. And on the other hand, Americans expect to pay. They expect to pay for healthcare. Why wouldn't they expect to pay for health research? So, okay, next one. Okay, I'll yeah, I'll I'll go and I can see one in the audience as well. Come to you next, then. Yeah. There was coverage in the papers yesterday about Viagra possibly being useful in the treatment mm -hmm. of, or prevention rather, of dementia. Mm -hmm. But obviously they need to do bigger trials. And I wondered how they would go about selecting people for that. Would it only be people at risk of early onset dementia or could anybody go in through it? Mm -hmm. And then if, you, if it did work, would you then be able to use it as a treatment for people with dementia who couldn't consent to be to take part in trials? What do you think? Yeah, so I, I'm not going to comment on how I think they are or might recruit because I haven't looked at the the sort of proposal for the protocols. But in terms of the, the sorts of issues that that brings up, um, I think it is a, it is another case where people who think they maybe have early early signs of dementia might say, look, if there's any treatment I want to try, I want to give it a go. Mm -hmm. um, but then how can, yeah, how can we include people in research where they may be getting to the stage where they can't express for themselves um, what, what they want, that sort of, do they have capacity to consent? But I think that's a perfect example of why if we were to fix strictly on consent and say, well, if you can't consent, you can't be in it, we'd leave a lot of people out who could both benefit directly if the treatment works, so they would be missing out on beneficial treatment. Um, they might, even if it doesn't benefit them, they, they might still want to be part of it for the purpose of generating knowledge and helping others. Um, yeah, so if we were to only focus on can they consent or not, we would be excluding a lot of people. Um, I think, I mean, in, a, in this sort of case, quite a bit of it might come down to a clinical determination about best interests, you know, or we, we think it, um, it could help you, or at least won't hurt you, to to take part in the trial, and so that's a justification, even where someone can't consent, that might be a justification for giving it as a treatment. Um, but I can't comment specifically on, on this proposal, because I haven't looked at it. Can I ask you about the quality of data mm. and the quality of outcomes of research? Um, my reading of the situation is you may criticise this idea, but um, randomised controlled trials give better information than observational trials. So do participants need to be told at the beginning that the type of trial they're entering might produce better or worse results than another type of trial? Yeah, um, great point. Um, I think, so, do, do people understand the difference between saying, yes, I agree for my health data to be included and we're going to do sort of large scale um, data intensive correlation and hope to find, to find things versus you are in a trial that's testing this particular specific drug interaction or effect in this condition. Um, my, my feeling on it is not everybody who takes part in either of those two kinds of research, I'm not sure everybody who takes part would understand that, that difference. 
I mean, the distinction between um, data-driven versus hypothesis-driven, the, the different kind of epistemology, if you like, of, of the two kinds of research is something that even scientists kind of are a little bit sometimes in disagreement over. Um, so do, do people understand the limitations, if you like, of, of the research? I mean, some of them, absolutely, yes. Uh, but I would also say some of them, very much not. Um, if I were to take part in different sorts of projects, you know, I understand that qualitatively there is a difference, but if you had to probe too much more, I might not be able to describe all the sort of machine learning algorithms that process my health data to tell me that I'm at X percent risk that or X percent risk this. So yeah, I, I mean, I think people probably often don't understand it fully, but what does that mean? Um, going back to that idea about being informed about, about research, uh, I think one aspect is that we we probably should try to, for some people it might not matter, you know, they, they might just say, I, I don't need to understand data science, I just, you know, as long as you do good things with it, it's fine. We should make sure that we respond to what people do want to know. Um, I'm trying, as you can probably tell, to avoid saying we should just make everybody more scientifically literate, because that will fix everything. I mean, def definitely, uh, I, part of what's going on with people wanting to read the peer-reviewed research and read the articles is people do want to know, and I think it's pretty clear that actually we could be doing more to, to fill that knowledge gap. There's a demand, at least from some people, for knowledge that is not that easy for them to, to get, and we could be doing more on that side. But I don't think it's necessarily a solution to make everybody take Data Science 101 and Clinical Trials 101 before they can sign up to either. Do you want to follow can, up on that? Can yeah. I have a follow-up yeah. question? In randomised control trials, um, my reasoning of the situation is that you have two pretty similar groups, one of which is given a supposed active treatment, yeah. and one is given a placebo, and the groups don't know which. Yeah, or the one against which you're comparing. Yeah. Yeah. And do not have a right to know which. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, the, the, the idea that you have a right, yes. Yeah. I don't think everybody, anybody's ever come and said, but I have the right to know which one I'm getting, as much as you get to know. So there is always that kernel of non-information at the heart of, you are, you are told that here is something you won't be told. Um, it does bring up an interesting, so a colleague of mine has done some interesting research around people sharing, um, sharing information with each other about clinical trial stuff on social media and how things can sometimes, I, I think there's either the possibility that you accidentally unblind things and compromise the results. Or, uh, yeah, I think if we think that the, the blind part, the double blind part of randomized controlled double blind trials is important for scientific validity, then people have kind of got to sign up to that and say this is what's going to make the study have have power, this is what's going to generate the useful knowledge, mm -hmm. and we need to all agree to that as part of the mm -hmm. kind of contract of, of taking part. Um, I thought of something else, but I've forgotten it again. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep going, it may come back. Um, have you seen any impact on the field based on COVID vaccinations? Because I guess you've mm -hmm. got, um, especially with consent, <laughs> so you've got people that don't believe in it, people that do believe in it, even those people that are perhaps hesitant in vaccinations and consent and this unproven testing yeah. and things. Yeah. feels like almost this is, this is what, but I guess how has that been addressed or how has that impacted the area really? It's, I think it's, it's really hard to tell and the question of to what extent has it shifted people's attitudes towards biomedical research and in what ways is a little bit more of a sociological one than an ethical one. Um, I will, yeah, I, I will say one thing I think COVID has done is really expose to people, um, if you like, the, the kind of naked shingle of the world when it comes to science, because we were all dealing with this massive um, uncertainty at the same time and some people, I think, there, there are groups of publics that have kind of dealt with that by, by understanding, like, this is what science does. And then there are other groups that have gone, look, if, if science can be right one day and wrong the next, then nothing is true anymore. You know, kind of has, <laughs> has given a bit of fuel to the whole um, 
anti-expertise, counter-science. Um, look, you've said that last month, but now you're saying something different, so therefore nobody can believe anything that science says. Um, what I thought was interesting during COVID was that much more direct, um, and on a, on a broad scale, the much more direct engagement with the knowledge production apparatus of science. So people starting to say, actually, um, what science is doing is making this knowledge in certain ways and what validates it, you know, peer review is one of those things, but also peer review research can be wrong. Mm -hmm. We can update our opinions as, as people go. So I think it has, it has changed the, the ways in which we can, we as publics can relate to science. What effects that's going to have? I mean, when I said the, the boundaries between healthcare and research are blurring, I think that's the obvious elephant in the room example about we've had to be starting treatments when we don't understand what we're dealing with. We don't know if this is going to work. We'll find out six months later the treatment protocol is different because we found out things as we were going along, trying to treat the disease and do research at the same time. But yeah, re really good example. Um, there was one in front. It was more a, a, an observation while you were talking yeah. about the right to participate. And I was thinking about the, initially when you put the question up, I thought, no, you shouldn't have a right to participate. But as you then went into that section, which you presented really well, I was reflecting on the obligation to participate is generally about the desire to help others. Mm -hmm. Whereas the right to participate is generally about I helping will me. Yeah. It's, it's a much yeah. more self, you know, one's about helping others and one's about helping me mm -hmm. or someone close to me. Yeah. And I, I saw that but I didn't know what to do with it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what to, what to do with it. <laughs> 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 you know, the example that was quoted here you know, in that piece in the, in the newspaper, you can imagine that some people will say yes. I want to participate, I should participate, mm -hmm. but it's, that's all about me. Yeah, well I think some people may say, if there's a treatment, I want it. Yeah. But I think that, I mean, altruistic participation is also, um, you know, people, people like, I don't know, I tend to believe people are generally good. You look at something like UK Biobank, people were not, you know, it wasn't like we'll pay you thousands of pounds. Mm -hmm. um, people went, hey, this is a great idea, we can contribute something. Uh, there was a, a fair bit of kind of pride in British science uh, around it as well, but people were like, hey, we can be part of something good. Let's create a bioresource that's going to help people in the future have better health and help, help our scientists make new discoveries. I think altruism is, is in there as well. Um, now, that was, that was not so much people knocking on the door saying, I demand my right to be included in biobank. Um, but I think inclusion in those sorts of, of projects is one place where considering the right, as I said, is, is maybe going to be useful, partly because it draws attention to who is not being given as much opportunity to participate. You know, when, when the thing, kind of things that we want to say we have a right to, you know, education, clean water, all of those sorts of things, where they serve is often to draw attention to the people who are not getting those opportunities and to say, hey, as a society, if they have a right, we have a duty to try and make sure they can exercise it. Um, oh, I see loads and loads of hands. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go this way across. Um, one, two, someone over here, and then David, because you've had one go already. I'll come to you after that. Um, is there a central data bank of all the trials that are being carried out that people, the public, can access to see? Um, there are clinical trial registries, uh, mostly on a country by country basis, uh, that people can access. When I was talking about, um, you know, things kind of masquerading as clinical trials and not reporting back, um, I don't know if they've started actually to to um, follow up on this. But if you register and then you don't report, there's kind of not that much I think that can that can be done. There's no information. There's just no information. That is not as good. That's not common practice here. I, I saw someone nodding about about that. If, um, so I do not conduct clinical trials myself. I'm not very closely engaged with getting clinical trial data in and out. Um, if you have yeah, if you have special expertise in this, please come in and and contribute. Yeah, I think um, 
the industry has got much more about self-regulating itself in terms of new medicines. So, yeah, there are consequences now because previously people didn't, say, publish negative results, right? Mm. For example, or something that yeah. closed. Yeah. But nowadays it's absolutely followed up on. So actually, all clinical trials have to be part of the register. Absolutely. And it is very much followed up on in terms of did that study stop? What was the outcome of that? Mm. It usually didn't used to be, but certainly the world did not yeah. Do, do you know in the US particularly what kinds of actions are being taken? If, you know, I mean, the FDA can be pretty tough. And, and actually come and yeah, say, look, no, you've absolutely. registered five separate yeah. trials and then just run away from them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's that's good to know. Yeah. No, thank you very much for that. You, you know more about this than I do. Yeah, um, the website is clinical trials.com. Yeah. For, it's the website yeah. that lists all of the clinical yeah. trials. Um, we talk about consent and mm -hmm. capacity to consent. Yeah. If uh, if someone lacks capacity, very often they can, prior to lacking capacity, they can actually have given power of attorney mm -hmm. for yep. their health, for instance, as yeah. one of the aspects, yeah. um, in terms of for medical treatment. How does power of attorney kick in or not kick in when it comes to medical research and giving consent? Um, so my understanding <coughs> is uh, you can either have power of attorney, which is a much more broad decision-making power, um, but you could also have something like an advanced directive. Mm -hmm. I think power of attorney probably would extend to decisions about research, but I think they'd also be, well, I guess it would be unlikely to be tested because the underlying presumption, if a clinician is saying, can we include this person in a trial, the clinician clearly thinks it's in their it's at least not against their interest or it might be in their interest to participate and then the person making the decision could just say no and then it's like oh, all right we didn't get consent for that um or if they say yes there'd, there'd kind of be no dispute about it if you see what i mean where whereas quite often who has the power who has the power to make a decision medically for someone else where it gets tested is because there's a dispute, because let's say the doctors think one thing should happen and parents think another. Or, but yeah, I, I can't think of any cases where that's actually been tested, but I would think that it would extend to, um, you know, consent for medical treatment would also extend to consent to taking part in research that was seen to be medically justified. Well, I, I would imagine, but as I say, not aware of any cases where, where that's been tested. Um, there was some, there was someone, yeah. I'm interested in a sort of secondary use of health data and in the example I, I came across of social care data uh, in relation to child protection services in some states of the US. Mm. The actuaries who use the health data that we have to increase our insurance costs if we have a particular risk of developing a later disease or if we are the kind of driver that ought not to be insured at all because it's going to cost the company money. <laughs> yeah. but the case I came across in America was much closer to the bone in a sense because the welfare systems in America for families with children who are in need is breathtakingly intrusive mm. to an extent I have never seen in social work records. Yeah. And it's staggering. And they were using this data and actuarial methodologies to be able to identify families at risk of a second abuse once one had taken place. Yeah. And almost every element of parental lives was seen as part of this. In some ways you might have said, okay, maybe you're identifying people at greater need of services, but they weren't providing the services. Mm -hmm. Just putting them under surveillance. For me, that's still got a real ethical puzzle about mm. it. I wonder if you've come across that. Uh, not specifically that case, mm. but um, in, in terms of how we use data, mm. uh, some of the big concerns, of course, have been around genetic data and mm. what that might reveal, and people being, you know, compromised in employment or denied life insurance or, or that sort of thing. Um, I guess that points up, when, you know, when I was saying, on the one hand, allowing that data to be used if it's going to be helpful for health reasons is easy rescue, but there are harms and risks that could be associated. I think definitely the potential that our data could be used in ways that will not be in our interests is, is very real. 
um, that that really gets kind of more into the data ethics area. It's not just the research, but the what are the uses that we make of it. Um, but yeah, I think it's a it's a really good example that just shows some of the dangers there. And that thing about um, you know it's not used to intervene early, just to um, you know know whose house to send the police to or or whatever. I guess similar things could be said about health data. That if what we do with um, if what we do with what we find from our uh, health data research is we know certain groups of people are more at risk of disease and what we then do is intervene and try and save them from disease, great. If what we do is pass it on to the insurance company to then say you're not getting health insurance, that's not so great. So yeah, yeah. What we what we find out is important, what we use it for is critical. Okay, David, you had another yeah. to do with the, the right the right to participate. Uh, and especially the right to participate at very high risk, mm -hmm. which you were discussing, which gave yeah. me some other questions. It occurs to me that there is also, or ought to be, a right for the researcher or the practitioner to refuse certain clients mm -hmm. on moral grounds, that I don't want to be a participant in your suicide. Yeah. Um, and, and so and that ethical right of the, of the practitioner to defend their own moral position Mm -hmm. would be an important life as well. Which you don't want unethical people in business. <laughs> no, I, I think absolutely there, there should be that, um, you know, we let people go mountain climbing, but we don't compel other people to take them. But, you know, we look at someone and say, there's no way you're going to get off Everest, um, but I'm not taking you there. So that's, you know, that's fine. Um, I guess... That what, what you've suggested there, though, also has a little bit of an element of conscientious objection to it. So uh, whether or not we think practitioners should say, look, it's against my personal codes of ethics to provide this service because... I mean, I suppose that because I don't want to help you commit suicide, uh, you, you sort of meant um, metaphorically mm -hmm. or in terms of this research is so dangerous that it might lead <coughs> to your death. Uh, but of course, in some places where assisted suicide actually is legal, there will be practitioners who say it's against my personal codes of ethics and I won't do it. And then there are consequences of that. Other very, very common is terminations of pregnancy where doctors may say it's against my code of ethics so I will not provide this vital reproductive health care service. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I suppose if it's something that is so... What's the role of the of, of ethics review here? Now, my, the usual take that I have on this, there are some sorts of research that effectively we say are too risky to be allowed to take place. And if a proposal were to go to say, let's do this trial, um, the scientific and ethical committees would look at it and say, there's not enough evidence, there's not enough proof of safety, there's not enough suggestion of mechanism of action and efficacy to justify exposing people to the risk to do it, and that study wouldn't even get up. Um, but I think it's important to recognise that there's an institutional role there that sort of protects doctors from having always to make that, that call themselves and to be the one to say, I'm judging the risk here and I think it's too much, but if you go to Dr Jones next door, he'll probably do it for you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that is a, a role of institutionalised oversight to help make those decisions on more than just an individual basis. One more before, yeah, if anybody's got any more, we ask David to do a vote at thanks. But it's not about trials, but particularly in parts of England just now, there's big outbreaks of measles mm. because children aren't getting vaccinated. Yeah. And I wonder where the sort of bioethics um, thinking is going. Like, how do you persuade parents to do it, or should it even be compulsory? Mm, then is that the vaccination? Uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, another perennial kind of ethical question. Um, you know, I guess this. Yeah, I didn't really address much the idea of if we had an obligation to participate in research because it's for the public good, would we consider conscripting people to it? You're kind of asking a similar question. It's in the public good for everyone to be vaccinated. Um, does that justify taking? measures to enforce people. So, you know, parents maybe have an obligation to vaccinate their children because it protects not only their children's health but that of children around them. 
could we, should we enforce that, should we make it mandatory? I mean, one answer would be if we don't need to, um, if there are other things that we can do. So I am politically a uh, small L liberal where I think if you, you know, if you don't need to put too many rules around people to achieve the society you want, then, then don't. If we didn't need to make it mandatory and we found other ways to encourage the vaccination levels up high enough that we got back to a level of herd immunity, I'd say we should do that before we went to any measures such as making it mandatory. Countries that have so-called mandatory programs, it's often not your children will be forcibly taken off you and held down and injected, even if you even if you say no. When they say mandatory, it's more things like they might be denied access to, say, public schooling or, or things like that. But then, of course, that has knock-on consequences because if you deny a child access to public schooling, the quality of their education is compromised. Again, what do we know about the groups who are more likely to be sceptical about vaccines and medical intervention, often already disadvantaged in other ways. So saying, we're going to disadvantage you further by saying no access to public schooling if you don't vaccinate your children is not necessarily going to have the, the best effect. It's a tough one, though. It, yeah, it's a worry. Okay, so if there's no more questions, would you like to do a vote of thanks? Every so often I, I make a point of reminding everybody of our Greek motto, Fanta Documenta, to test all things. And so this evening I think we've had an exceptionally appropriate lecture for a society like ours. Not only because of our commitment to testing all things, but because all of us, just by virtue of being alive, and for, well, I must be careful what I say, but for many of us, not being quite as young as we once were, all of us, without meaning to, are already participants in a whole series of experiments, either intentional or natural. And I think this evening, we've been given a great deal of help in thinking through what that means for us as members of this society, as citizens, as human beings, and to some extent, as guinea pigs. So I think we should all uh, thank Dr. Chan in whichever capacity we think applies most to us for, for preparing us intellectually this evening. Thank you very much.